Welcome. Here we are at episode eight of the Six Star Business Podcast. How are you? Hi, I'm um, good. Thanks. How are you doing? I am fabulous. Fabulous. You've been back a week off holiday. You've been back a week of holiday a week. It probably seems like a like another lifetime ago, does it? What holiday? <laughs> what holiday? <laughs> I hate that. Don't you hate that? <laughs> yeah, when you come back off holiday and you think all I want to do is just go back on another holiday. <laughs> um, but it's not um, been all bad. You've been, you've you've got you've got to you've um been able to hang out with me for a bit since you come back. That's uh, I'm very grateful for that. I must it? Admit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Did you miss me? I must say, has it been good to have me back? Uh, I, I enjoyed the lions in the morning because I did up <laughs> did up early to to uh, have our have a daily daily call to to fit okay. in with the time zone difference. So um, I enjoyed that, but I, I did miss our did miss our chats. Yeah, uh, they're um. Yes. A big, big part of uh, my my working week. And and how have, all, so, how have you been? Uh, I yeah. know where you are. Things are opening up. People are getting out and about and enjoying the sunshine uh, in the UK. Yeah, definitely. Uh, pubs are open. Uh, took took our two boys that live at home with us. We took them to the pub on uh, Sunday, uh, which was nice. Uh, neither of them uh, drink. Um, what one one doesn't and the other's too young <laughs> but uh, so maybe it was just an excuse for Andrew and I to go for a drink uh, but it was great you know the sun was shining and uh you know people people are happy so yeah things are uh are looking good from that uh from that uh, that that regard yeah so uh good to hear all right well let's um get cracking and, and introduce the uh our guests for episode number eight yeah, got, absolutely. So we uh, we have uh, two people, as always, Rob Drummond and Rashid uh, Cotwell. Uh, Rob is uh, an old friend of mine, so it was great to uh, connect with him uh, on the podcast. Uh, and Rashid is uh, someone that uh, Avalyn, you and I have both met through the Connect Collaborative. Uh, and great, again, just the, the random connections of people just booking into the, the same time slot. Uh, created a really uh, great, great uh, dynamic. Do you remember the? Do you remember the conversation? It's quite a while ago now since we had it. Yeah, but I do. And Rob, uh, you know, brought out some really cracking stories. You know, he bought a house last year, and he's going through some house renovations along with you know being a, a parent of young children and juggling all those plus his business. But he brought out some stories around what it's like for him with the tradespeople and that experience and. You know, that opened up a fabulous conversation around, you know, consistency of care, duty of care, what that really means, you know, you know all, all of that. And Rashid added to it. It was it was really great because I think every person has dealt with tradespeople. We know what it's like to be let down. We know what it's like to be, uh, I guess, treated really well. We know the difference, don't we? And this this podcast episode is one for everybody. I mean, they all are, but this yep. one really talks about the everyday experiences that we have, and when and how to know when we've when we've had a, a great one, but also how to deliver that. Amen. So, without much further ado, let's uh, let's press play, yes. and uh, we'll see you, dear listener, on the other side. Enjoy. Hello and welcome. This is another scintillating, exciting episode of the Six Star Business Podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Pete Daly Dixon, and I'm joined by my other co-host, who is Avalyn Clark. Woohoo! Looking all purpley and and I was going to say sparkly, but there's no sparkles uh, on you. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks, Pete. How are you? Yeah, really good. Yeah, you're at the end of your day. I'm at the beginning of my day, and yes. uh, we're joined by. Uh, two people who each are at the beginning and end of their days. So we've got Rob Drummond joining us uh, from UK. I was getting tired of just being on these uh, podcasts with Australians. It's like, come on, man, we've got to, we've got to hold the side. It's up really here. nice to do one in the and, morning. Uh, also, actually, I do all of my podcasts in the evening, so it's really nice to do one in the morning. So there we go. Absolutely, and uh, Rashid Cotwell has also uh, joined us uh, from Australia. So Rob, seeing as you kind of um, butted rudely in there, I'm only joking. Um, 
uh, getting a contribution off to off to an early start. So, um, Rob, who who are you, and where are you, and um, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, my name is Rob Drummond, uh, based in Sheffield, Northern England. Um, I've got a business called Story Copywriters. Uh, so essentially, I teach email marketers how to write stories that sell, and then map those stories to appropriate places in the customer journey. Quite, quite a sort of long and winding road to get to that point. I've, um, I've basically done every digital marketing job you can imagine to varying degrees of competency. Um, and I keep coming back to, I keep coming back to CRM. I keep going back to copywriting. I've had uh, stints in other other media. Um, did a lot of Google ads and paid advertising as well. So kind of pulling all that together. Um, but yeah, my, my thing is sort of helping people tell better stories about their work. Fabulous. And, uh, and it is fabulous, yeah. And he's very, very good at what he does. Um, give, give us an, in, give us and our listeners a, an insight into, um, you know, Rob the, the family man. Oh, yeah. So I have a, I have a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home. So we had a lockdown baby last year, which I do not recommend under any circumstances. <laughs> not only that, she was born two months early. So oh, it's, it's, it's been a bright ride. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I just, I'm at home a lot, which I'm grumpy about, but. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps we, won't, we won't open that kind of worms right now. Um, but yeah, I do, um, do bits of barefoot running um, in the summer when it's warmer um, on grass. There's a, there's a story behind that. I um, had shin splints when I was younger and yeah, went to all sorts of physios and um, I was told all sorts of things. And uh, one guy basically said, well, you know, you basically never see Kenyans limping off a running track. It's because they grow up barefoot and it develops the level like muscles and I was like well actually that makes sense to me because that, that gets back to core principles so I've been you know on and off running barefoot since then um, and um, yeah it just sets a good foundation for everything else cool all right it's great to have, have you with us and uh, Rashid welcome to the Six Star Business Podcast who are Thank you, you and how are you who am I and how am I? Uh, well, okay, so uh, my name is Rashid Kotwal. I, I live in Sydney. I have uh, lived in Sydney since 1972, which is a bloody long time, seeing as I'm only 35. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for the last, uh, uh, so I'm married. Uh, Barbara, my wife, is Swiss German, so I know where my bread is buttered. Uh, I have uh, two children. One is um, turning 32, two boys. One is turning 32. The other one's turning 20, 28. Yeah, 28. Yeah, one lives here. We'll, 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 edit, we'll, edit, we'll edit that bit. So, like, there's no, there's no pause. It's just, we'll just. <laughs> uh, for the last 20 years, we've run a practice in the area of uh, business growth, uh, focusing uh, primarily on uh, marketing and then uh, now our focus is on sales. So helping organizations uh, who sell complex uh, products and services, mainly services, into larger corporations, uh, uh, shorten the sales cycle and, uh, and win more deals uh, because everything happens when somebody sells something. And everything else is on some level superfluous. Try saying that fast. Uh, unless you can sell, you can be great at delivery, but not much will happen. Yeah. And uh, that was our journey yeah. as business coaches back in the day when we used to say, okay, let's put it in systems. Let's do all these other things. But they didn't actually sell anything. A big lesson for us. Great. Well, I, um, I know that both uh, Rob and Rashid, that you're – your contribution to the ongoing conversation, which uh, Avil and I uh, started, um, well, the conversation around Six Star Business actually started back in September, was it? When we kind of just on uh, one of our calls and um, we were talking about customer excellence and how some businesses just seem to always get five star ratings. Um, and what is it that separates five star businesses from a two star business? Uh, and then we were thinking, well, if there was a sixth star available, what, what would be required of a business to uh, to get that uh, that six star rating. So uh, ho hopefully that that sort of context, if you like, of the conversation is uh, is clear uh, to you. Um, and uh, uh, both of you, Rashid and Rob, will have um, heard about the six star uh, business uh, context before coming on the on the call. Um, and I, I'm always interesting curious at the at the beginning of these conversations just to 
to find out uh, what what it was, if you like, uh, about the, the concept of a, of a six star business when you first uh, heard it about it, either from from Avalyn or, or myself, uh, that that kind of grabbed your attention enough to want to come on a, a, a podcast. Uh, and maybe you're just a podcast junkie. I don't know. <laughs> That's fine too. But you know, if if there was something that grabbed your attention and held your interest long enough to come on this podcast with us, um, I'm curious. What what was it? I can Rob? I can speak to that. Yeah. So. Um... We also moved house last year, and consequently, we're, we're trying to get trades people around to the house to do all sorts of bits of work. Trying to get people to come around to the house to quote for work, and then to even just follow up on those quotes um, and just provide any level of decent experience. I found utterly sparse in the last twelve months. So, actually, how how do you go about building a six star business instead of what I would regard as not even a one star business? Which is what a lot of people seem to be doing, because because it, it's often that these people are credible, skilled tradespeople. It's not that they, it's not that they can't do the work. It's all of the stuff around that is the systems and the and the follow up and the quotes and all of that kind of stuff. That to me, is the quality of the experience. So I thought, you know, perhaps that's perhaps that's something we can sort of drill down on. Yeah. What about you, Rashid? I think. Uh... I'd agree with Rob. I mean, it's almost impossible to get a tradesperson to uh, to turn up when they say they're going to turn up and actually do the job and actually finish the job half the time. <laughs> and so I it's think, a global uh, experience, then, not just the UK. Oh, it's. I think it's a worldwide experience, frankly. Uh, you know, people just uh, have no sense of customer service, and I think um, you know my my take with a six star business is is a business that uh, is customer centric, uh, without being a doormat. So you can serve, but not be a servant. And uh, and I think a lot of the attributes, certainly for me, of being a six-star business is your level of communication with your clients. You know, do you communicate uh, at the right time in the right way, the way your clients want you to communicate? And I think Rob, and you know, anyone who's experienced a tradesperson who, who doesn't turn up and doesn't communicate and whatever knows exactly what that means <laughs> when that doesn't happen. I'd even accept the lower quality of work if they actually just turned and did it. But yeah, yeah, eighty percent, ninety percent is usually good yeah. enough, but zero percent isn't. Av, you're on mute. Yeah, I'm just making sure my background noise doesn't interrupt the flow. Um, I like what you just said then, you know, it's a, a couple of things. It's customer centric without being a doormat. Uh, Rashid, can you ex expand on that? I'm really fascinated to understand maybe an experience you've had or what that really means. How does that, how does that look? Okay, so I, um, you know, I, Rob, you'd be familiar with uh, Perry Marshall. I don't know if uh, Evelyn and Peter, yeah, but yeah. I remember you know, donkeys years ago, uh, Perry talking about a client who used to try and bite his fingers off one digit at a time. And it comes down to what you, look, one of my favorite sayings is you get what you tolerate. And that goes for your family, it goes for your kids, it goes for just about everything in life. Okay, so what you put up with is what you end up getting. And my thing is, uh, if you allow, you need to set the framework for how you will deal with your clients and you expect your clients to deal with you in a professional manner. And it comes down to setting a level of expectation on both sides. This is what I will do. This is what you will do. This is what I expect. This is what you can expect from me. This is what I expect from you. And I think very often we find ourselves, and I'm saying it with a particular client at the moment, of with his clients, he's getting subsumed into spending, you know, God knows how many hours a day every day uh chasing stuff you know uh clients just you know want more and more and more and more and he's getting more and more and more frazzled and therefore you know he's neglecting what he needs to do in his own business which of course is get out and market and sell more and the end result of a lot of these things is that people take advantage of you because they allow you allow them to take advantage of you but very often in fact not very often you 99 percent of the time that happens because you haven't set it up correctly in the first place 
you haven't set the framework of what is a professional relationship and what will you do for the and what will I you know what will I do for the money that you're paying me and what can you expect in return I'll give you another interesting example we're going through right now so um, I've got another previous client who is trying to sell his business I put him in touch with two brokers one of them happens to be a very close friend of ours and that's the broker they went with now interestingly enough I got a phone call from said ex-client ranting and raving this afternoon saying oh you know the broker hasn't done this and he hasn't done that and he hasn't communicated and he hasn't put people in front of me and blah 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 and we've got you know uh, one person who was offering a certain amount of money in december now that's dropped by fifty thousand, etc etc and i'm at my wits end and i'm really stressed can you talk to said broker and i'm going hmm, okay this is going to be interesting so i phone up broker and i get a completely different story Broker says, I have spoken, I have put at least 10 people in front of this person, uh, but there are all of these other issues, and these are the reasons when they wouldn't accept the uh, the offers that were put to them, et cetera, et cetera. So completely different, you know, completely different stories. So who's right and who's wrong, okay? The point is, and I said this to the broker, I said, well, how often did you actually tell a client that you had communicated with a person, negotiated on his behalf, back with you know what are your records of how many times you have done all of this stuff that the client knows nothing about so all the client sees is a black box and he thinks the broker is doing nothing whereas the broker is going i've done all of this stuff but the client doesn't know it and i feel really frustrated therein lies the disconnect and so sorry sorry machine no so if 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 you're going to be a six-star business or even a five-star business or four-star business, it's incumbent on you to be able to communicate both ways and both parties need to know what is expected and how you are going to communicate mm-hmm. those, those expectations and those results. And I think that it's just one example that just came up today. Yeah, I mean, there's very clear an example you gave there, Rashid, and it kind of, it's, it's interesting, these conversation, each individual conversation t- tends to, to start to focus on a particular aspect of a six star business. And I guess over, um, you know, the months and the years that we we do this, we'll get the full um, kind of 360 degree view of what makes a six star business. But what I'm picking up on uh, from both of you uh, so far on this call is it's about, it's about communication and it's about expectation. Because Rob, I, I, I guess, would it be true to say that if the tradesperson came to you and said, um, we just need to tell you that, uh, you know, we 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 won't follow up on any quote that we send you, and it will take you take us at least six weeks to get a quote to you. Uh, at, at least then you've got some some measure of 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 kind of you know how they're doing against it. Would that would, would that be fair? Is is it is it as simple as as setting expectations? Yeah, we had a guy around to quote for doing a patio at the back of the house uh, a few days ago, and he said, "Look, we're booked up until September." And the reason for that is because no one's going abroad, so everyone's getting the patios done. And you know, if someone if someone says they can do it next week, I would be deeply suspicious that they can actually do, do a good job. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, it's it's like it's like when you go to um, I don't know New York or London, and you catch a tube, and you can see the the sign where it says the next tube is going to be in seventeen minutes. So you don't necessarily mind waiting the seventeen minutes because you know how long it's going to be. It's when mm. there's an indeterminate period of time that you're sitting there waiting. Like, is it going? Is it going to come? I don't know. Right. And would it be fair to say that that simply meeting expectations is is the the mark of a six star business, or does it does it need more than that? I think I think I think it's one aspect of it. Um, I think it probably ties also to sort of repeatability is that one-off are you doing it are you delivering a result consistently are you gathering the testimonials i I think ultimately it ties to reputation i think reputation has become a big leverage point um now that you know google reviews are so important now that we can access many more you know potential suppliers it's like well yes what experience to provide but is does that translate into your reputation because that's ultimately something that's leverage like leverageable as a business asset I think I think uh, any business needs to meet expectations. I mean, surely that should be a given. <clears throat> it's what you do beyond those expectations. I think that uh, that come in. Uh, here's here's another example. So, 
uh, I was talking to uh, a, uh, someone in another community we belong to, and she said uh, she just moved out of, out into a small country town outside an hour out of Brisbane, <clears throat> and she had the pest controller who she used to use for years in Brisbane um, come out and do the job. And he and once he sprayed the house, he said, "Oh, let me show you something." He said, come and have a look at the hinges on the bathroom door. And he said, those hinges on the bathroom door are actually different to all the other hinges in the house. So that if somebody gets it trapped in the bathroom, you can literally lift the door off the hinges, even if it's been locked from the inside. And her response to this was, wow, that is something that he did not have to mention. He could have just sprayed the house. He could have noticed it, said absolutely nothing, but he added in her mind real value by pointing this out and saying, here is something you didn't know that could possibly save your life or somebody's life if they get trapped, have a seizure or whatever in a bathroom. And I thought that was a great example of going beyond expectations and doing something. You know, it's the old thing, if you see something, say something. Well, most people don't say anything. That's brilliant, um, Rashid. It, it makes me think it's a, like it's about giving without expectation because that man, he was prepared to provide more of his knowledge and expertise, which was outside of, like you said, the spraying, but it was also something that was going to help her. Yeah, and the colliery yeah. is, she said, listen, I'm going to ask him, even though it's an, even though he is an hour away, I'm going to ask him rather than to come back the next time rather than some local mm. in the area. Absolutely. So he keeps the business. Now, yeah. As long as he's happy to come up, he's going to keep the business. So it's about building loyalty. I think six, you know, the six-star yeah. business is, is about going beyond what you would normally be expected to do and doing something unexpected that says people go, oh, wow, okay. It's kind of viewing clients as someone that's under your care and protection. So you're doing the right thing for them at all stages, even if that doesn't necessarily correlate to the job that you were called out to do in the first place. Hmm. Say, say that again, Rob. So no, I think it's like viewing a client as someone that is under your care and protection, not someone that you're just you know, servicing to do a job that you've been called out to do this particular thing. Hmm. Um, and as soon as you add this kind of level of care and protection, it can it kind of changes. It's like you there's an element of of, of leadership where you're kind of leading the clients to do to to almost point out things that they've not seen because there's always oversights, there's always shortages of understanding where you know more than the clients about this particular thing. That is so interesting. Um, I was reflecting on what you were saying, Rob, and I'm wondering, does that come from a place where someone genuinely loves what they do or do they need to have a sense of genuinely caring about other people and wanting to help them? Because it sounded to me like what you were saying was there's a difference between someone who goes above, and Rashid said this as well, like take goes that extra step versus just doing a service, just doing what they were paid or contracted to do. I think there's a level of experience that comes with doing enough jobs to know that you behaving in that way benefits you most in the long term because that generates more referrals. It generates it generates benefits further down the line. Um, and I, I think there's probably like a level of experience you have to get to to get to that point in the first. So, so yeah, I think the answer to, to the two questions that you posed is yes, there's elements of both of those things. I think there's also maybe a bit of introspection that actually it's also in your best interest as well to to sort of you know run your business that way i mean i am um, i've got various examples of this i mean i i was um i worked as a google ads consultant for a long long time and um very easy business to get into pretty much anyone can set up as a google ads consultant or especially at the moment as a facebook ads consultant there's more there's more facebook ads consultants than, than there are you know Docs in Sheffield, it's, it's ridiculous. Very easy to get into. Um, a lot of the sales tactics are very questionable. Um, I don't think there's like, it's very easy to say, yeah, people, you know, care and protect them. It's very easy to say this this sort of thing. It's it's much harder to actually do that, especially when you're presented with a business opportunity. I think it, I think it takes that sort of, I think it helps when you're not really needed the work. I think if you, if, if you, 
if it if you need this work to pay for the next mortgage installments uh, yeah this, this is this is where it starts to get to get more tricky so i think i think it's like you have to be in a situation where it's like yeah you'd like to do the work but it's not like it's it's not affecting the breadline next month as well um and I, th I think i think all of these all of these things tie in together i think it's a multifaceted thing rashid what are your thoughts does it take that you, if you remember the questions i posed to rob what what are your thoughts on those hmm. I think if you genuinely love what you do, but you also do it in service of others, I think the the thing that I would not, I would postulate is that a lot of people won't open their mouths because they feel maybe it's not their place, or uh, um, uh, you know they 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 think oh well the person wouldn't want to know or whatever you know it could be any any number of a myriad of reasons, but I think. I think in some respects, and, and you have to do it respectfully, you have to say, okay, do I have a duty of care to this person? And it's not, it's not giving advice where it isn't wanted. So it really comes down to what is the circumstance that you're going to be opening your mouth and saying, hey, listen, I noticed something over there. I think certainly if it's a life and death situation or something that could be a hazard, I think it, it's incumbent on you to say something. Uh, but if you, uh, for instance, are a uh, life coach and, uh, you know, you're just talking to somebody, it's not incumbent on you to say, hey, listen, I think you're full of shit. Unless they ask. And even then, I'm not sure they want to know. <laughs> unless, unless you want to get fired. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> or punched. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be within the boundaries of why you were there in the first place. Otherwise, you're just kind of passing off. Yeah, it's 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 not your place to say otherwise. Do you think it's a worthwhile ambition, if you like, to aim to be a six-star business? What 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 are the what are the kind of what might the benefits be? Well, I I I mean, for for reasons I sort of said earlier, I think I think there's real benefits in terms of reputation and building a long-term sustainable flow of new business leads because people know that you provide that outcome uh, consistently you know so, something we talked about last last year a lot Pete was obviously as as it's easy to to provide a repeatable experience and and so on on a small scale but as soon as you scale it as soon as you bring on some, you know members of staff like this is where all of these things fall apart which is where you know like a lot of the work that you've been doing with your systems is kind of ties into that. It's like how how, how do you scale up the experience? You know, that's that's also probably what probably McDonald's have done better than anyone anywhere um, in, in terms of achieving that. Um, and on, on that basis, they probably could. I mean, it's debatable, isn't it? But they probably do qualify as a, as a six star business in some respects based on that. Possibly not in terms of the food and the actual dining experience, <laughs> and the actual dining experience, but behind the scenes, I think I think they probably did. Well, if that's if that's the food you want, and and you're happy with the dining experience, the very fact that they can produce something that is of very consistent quality, whatever you think of the quality, that's not in debate here. Uh, that makes them a six star business. And if you go with the fact that they are the gold standard when it comes to uh, uh, systems and procedures, I mean, how many businesses do you know that are run by sixteen year olds yeah. on a day to day basis? So they didn't create the systems, but. Think about it. Same for Starbucks, that has to be a six-star business yeah. as well on the same basis. Yeah. Not the best coffee, but certainly not. <laughs> so, do you feel do you feel um, any uh, amount of care and protection when you're in a in a McDonald's or a Starbucks? No, because I think it's it, it, it's it's probably not. That's a more transactional arrangements then i'm trying to achieve a longer term goal so i think maybe it depends on the on the nature of the business i think for someone like you know probably in our worlds more so where you're kind of working with you know potentially a software clients or single clients over a longer period of time then i think all of these factors of care and protection probably come to the fore a lot more um if i'm buying a coffee of someone then yeah i mean there's obviously elements elements of that but 
But I, I think fundamentally, I want I want the experience to be good. To, to be good, I want the product to be good, and I want it to be repeatable and consistent. Um, even even when I go to different outlets of that store in different city, in different cities around the world, that, that okay, that's, so that's quite a big challenge, I think. Yeah, that that is a big challenge. But let's let's just say you keep it local, and you and you like your particular coffee shop, whatever that coffee shop is, and the barista knows you by name, and and every time you walk in, he he or she says, "Hi, Rob." Um, usual makes the that's, usual that's and it's, it's that's, the that's same yeah. yeah and it's the same quality every time because uh, uh, you know they know what they're doing and and uh, the new owner didn't come in and change the coffee beans and therefore change everything thinking that we was going to get it at a cheaper price and I've seen that happen so you know what was considered to be a very successful cafe where it had you know loyal following owner changes uh, decides that uh, he doesn't want to pay whatever he pays to, you know, for those quality supplies and the quality people. So first the people leave, well, the supplies change, then the people leave, and then the customers leave. <laughs> so I think keeping keeping the standards uh, can be very difficult, especially if you're growing. Now that's very keeping the standards relatively easy for us as practices because you know I'm the practice, you know, I do the work. The, the danger comes when you stretch yourself too far and then you start going, okay, well, I don't have time to do the things that I used to do for people. You know, so as an individual, how do you scale? Hmm. Well, you, I know you have a... No, go on. I was just going to say, even as an individual, if you're, off, if you're trying to do too many things, and I've, I've fallen foul of this. Yeah, it's, that's right. It's, that's what it's I mean. trying to do copywriting. It's trying to sell Infusionsoft. It's trying, to, it's trying to manage the Google ads. It's trying to manage the Facebook ads. It's fighting with the websites. It's arguing with the web designer. It's like, why am I doing all of this stuff? This is not a good, <laughs> this is not a six-star experience for me or, no. them, or for them. So. No, then you've got to figure out what is it that you do really well and stick to that and then have other people do the other stuff. But then you've also got to make sure that that quality is being delivered, especially if you're going to project manage this stuff. Av, I know you've got a story just um, circling back to McDonald's and whether there's care and protection involved in that uh, that you wrote about um, in uh, the chapter of the book that we collaborated on. Yeah, that's relevant to yeah. thank you for bringing it up. I I was thinking about that. So I worked at McDonald's as a young lady, like young young teenager, and I became yesterday. Yes, of course, just a, just a couple of years ago, <laughs> and I became a manager at seventeen. Seventeen about that, and was a manager for two or three years. So I worked at Macca's for about five years, and one of the early experiences I had was in on McHappy Day. You've probably heard of McHappy Day, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a big day in Australia because all of the stores, they kind of compete and some of the bigger stores get celebrities in to kind of serve people on the front tills and all that kind of stuff to try and boost boost numbers. It's all about, you know, raising money for Ronald McDonald House, and uh, which is a charity here. And our store loved it. You know, we did lots of promotion and um, I think there was a celebrity who came in in the evening. But this one day I was a young girl and I was told you're going to be on the front till on McHappy Day. So that in itself was a big deal because you had to be one of the best in, in the store as, a, as an employee. So they had these internal mechanisms to drive performance even higher from these young 14, 15 year olds, 15, 15, 16 year olds. So we were driven. There was co competitive nature to it, first of all. And we also knew that we were always going to be judged externally by mystery shoppers who would go around the store and buy the product and everything once a week. So we always knew that there was someone watching, listening, and we would be rated accordingly. So come a happy day. So, so these are just some of the levers that McDonald's use. And of course, there's all their staff training and all of that kind of thing internally. So the happy day came and I hated beyond a beyond a passion, the whole, you know, upsell, would you like fries with that? It was something ingrained. We all have to do it. And on a happy day, there's a manager walking up and down and, you know, running around and everybody had to make sure you did it. Otherwise you could almost get a warning. Like literally that's how strict it was. So the lines, there's six tills going, six registers. The lines are back to the front door of people come the rush hour at lunchtime and I'm doing my thing. You know, it's just rote, like, you know, saying the same words, ringing up on the till, running to get the stuff there, you know, serving someone. And it was very robotic and it was pretty much, you know, a, a race. Anyhow, 
something clicked in me because I started to get really sick of the whole would you like fries with that and people just go no they don't even listen to the words because people know what's coming they know you're going to say it and they just tune out so in this book that I contributed chapter to um, that Pete mentioned I mentioned how I, I kind of decided in that moment that in the, with, a, with a line back to the door I was going to do something different and I decided to just pause a little bit, look in the eyes of the person I was talking to, smile and, and say something a bit different. I didn't want to use the same words because as, as a 16-year-old, I still knew that the words meant something. They were really important. So if I used the same language that everyone else did, it would be ignored, wouldn't be heard. You know, the would you like fries with that? Would you like a drink with that? So I used different words and connected Oh, you know, we've got some fries. I can't remember exactly the words I used, right? But it was different language to would you like fries with that? It was something else. Like we've just got some new fry, hot fries, nice and fresh. Would you like some as well just to add to your meal? Something like that. And I found people started to say yes. And I'm like, crap, this stuff works. And, and I didn't really understand what I was doing as a 16-year-old. I just knew that I was doing something different. But I started to notice the person in front of me rather than seeing them as just another number because McCappy Day, with that many people, the whole goal was to get the maximum number of people through those tills. And what they also do, on the, on the registers, there's a button, there's an upsell button. So when you upsell someone, you actually press the upsell button and enter what you've upsold. And that way they track what people have upsold. So at the end of the session, they know exactly who's been on what register and how much you've actually actually upsold. So at the end of the next day or whatever, they did all the tallies of the numbers and, you know, we made it, we broke a record of sales that, that day. And someone tapped me and said, oh, Aveline, you, you, you broke the record or you, you got the highest upsell vo um, volume of the day. And then there was a big round of applause and all this stuff. And I'm like, wow. But the difference was I made a point to say things differently and show that I cared. Even though I was a little bit slow, it took a, you know, a few extra seconds in the delivery, but it worked. Do you, do you, do you think, um, Robert, I, uh, I know you got a question there, but do you think it's to do more to do with the different words or to do with the fact that you, you connected with another human being before, before you actually said said what you said i think it's the first because if i didn't connect and really look at them in the eye and pause and smile then it still would have felt a little bit un unauthentic inauthentic i had to connect with them visually and get that that the non-verbal and the and the visual connection happening in order for me to get them to actually listen and go, oh, oh, yeah, that sounds good. That's what people were saying. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they wouldn't have they wouldn't have listened unless you'd broken, stopped, got the connection. Yeah. Oh, this is just not another transaction. Oh, yeah, let's let me take my train and go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You created a pattern okay. interrupt without mm -hmm. actually going off script. Or not far off script. Nobody noticed that you had gone off. Oh, but no, the managers script. didn't notice. That was just mayhem. It was it was literally mm. mayhem. So it was the day that I could did, do it without kind of being noticed. Did it, did you ever say that to anybody, as in tell anybody in McDonald's that this is no. what you did? Interesting. So a chapter in the book was your was yeah. your confession. Exactly. And I will say that what mm. you were saying before, Rob, about you know, um, you know, could could McDonald's be a five star or a six star experience? And I think because McDonald's versus another McDonald's versus even a Hungry Jack's or another place that has coffee or burgers, you know, on product it's pretty similar. It could be. Let's just say McDonald's versus McDonald's. So then what distinguishes McDonald's shop A from McDonald's shop B? in terms of a six-star experience? Uh, the people. 
the people. Okay, so I remember when when I was a heck of a lot younger, and I used to go and uh, uh, have um, uh, chicken McNuggets for lunch. God help me. Okay, probably ruined my health. Anyway, that's another story. But the, there was one particular young lady in the McDonald's in Chatsworth that I used to go to. She would look at me and she knew I liked fresh hot fries and I would not, I would wait for them if they weren't ready. Okay. And she would put in just a handful for me when she saw me. That to me is six stars. Okay. She didn't have to do that. That's probably completely against McDonald's terms of service, but she did it. Yes, that's right. I, I, it, it resonates beautifully because she cared. And so you would keep going back yeah. because you knew that she yeah. cared about you and back. gave you the yeah. fresh hot nuggets. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was another guy where I used to have a uh, kebab and he would always put in extra meat when he saw me. Mm -hmm. To the point where I was actually saying, look, I actually don't want extra meat because the damn thing falls apart. But I know you I know you want to value my loyalty. So it was, it was really quite funny and quite ironic in a way. But I mean, this is what people do when they actually know who you are and they, they notice yeah. and they remember. Yeah. And that happened 40 years ago. All right. So we're not talking... Mm -hmm. And I still remember yeah. it was just interesting that that this, this conversation triggered that because that, that happened a long time ago. There we go, mm. and you still remember. It. So you can you you, you yeah you can have it seems to be that you can have that care, well certainly care if not protection even in a transactional environment. And it just with, with what Rashid said just at the end there reminds me of that that saying that um, pe people forget what you what you say, but they remember how you made them feel. Made them feel. Uh, and, and, and there you go, like 40 years on from an event, you remember, and you can probably picture the guy's face, can you? Yeah, and you can, I can, and I can picture the girl, more, the, more or less I can for, picture the girl, yeah. yeah. And yeah. doesn't that lead into what Rob was saying earlier about the Google reviews? Because isn't it, or don't we rate people on how we, they make us feel largely, or do we? I'm um, interested. I think it's based, I mean, it depends a little bit on the service, doesn't it? But I think, I think mostly it's based on the emotional ex experience that's, mm -hmm. that's connected to your dealings with them. You know, we're mm -hmm. far more compelled. Um, I, I do not leave many reviews uh, on products. Just, I, I'm, I'm just not a reviews person. Like some people are, like some people will sift you lots of reviews. For me, like the bigger the purchase, the fewer reviews I read and the more I just go with gut feel. Um, but I am, um, I, I did review, I did review one of Perry Marshall's books last week, his uh, Facebook ads book, just because I, I, I felt like they'd obviously taken extreme steps to point out potential problems that maybe often were even to do with the Facebook ads platform. It was to do with funnels and other things that were related. It's like they didn't have they didn't have to put any of that in the book. But ultimately from reading the book I felt cared for and protected, I guess. Mm. So I I went to the left to review. Um, and I I I hardly ever do that. I, I think I've I think I've left like three reviews ever on on, on Amazon. So. Yeah, I hardly I, I'm I'm into I hardly ever leave reviews, but I certainly read them, especially for yeah. a bigger purchase. Yeah, I'm the same. Um, just just as we as we come to the end, Rob, I am interested in because your your the work you do with clients tends to be before they've before they've become a client, and it's you know we we, we can all at some level understand how to engage with a with another human when we're delivering our service and we can you know provide that the, the kind of care protection you know what um, the communication meeting exceeding expectations all that we've talked about um, when we're kind of in that that uh, that environment um, but can, can you just talk uh, a, a little bit to um, how to where where you're where the where the um, I'm being, I'm in this state again Avalyn where it's clear in my mind what I want to ask but it's not I think I think out. I know what you should have asked um, and I think, so yeah. my work is really for people with longer sales cycles and it's a trust-based sale. It's not just I'm nipping into Starbucks. Um, and in that situation, like you can't just go straight to the sale to find out if it's a good, if it's a good experience or not. 
Um, so a lot of the work that I do is helping people tell their story so that by the time, so I guess my my story behind behind this is that when I first set up a business as a Google Ads consultant, I did various things to get clients, but one of the things was I created a lead magnet on my website. Um, it was called How to Waste a Thousand Pounds on Google AdWords in No Time Flat. When people opted into that, they had the, an Aweber email sequence. There's about 14 emails in that sequence that told stories about me, anecdotes about how I go into this. And I had two types of clients. The first type of client was people who just found my website, they rung me up um, or booked you know, my time trade as it, was, as it was then. They wanted to know how much I charged what my hourly rate was and just on often I had one guy on the phone who just wouldn't accept that I didn't have an hourly rate. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, you must have one. <laughs> um, the other type of client was people who'd opted in for the lead magnet, sat, sat through the email sequence and eventually decided, yeah, I trust this guy. I'm, I want to, I'm ready to have a sales conversation. And those people already felt like they knew me to some degree. The sales conversation was a lot less stressful. We weren't, they weren't asking for references. We were just working out you know, is there a project to be done that's mutually beneficial and just working out the arrangements? Um, so it was like it was like the red ocean was dealing with the people who just stopped, who just found me, and the blue ocean with no sharks in the water was people who'd actually had the stories and sat on the email list for a little bit. So it was it was a slower sale, but much nicer clients to work with. So, so what 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 do you get from that, Av? that people want to create connections and they want to feel understood they want to feel a connection with someone and and feel that level of trust and empathy and knowing and understanding before they make a commitment because if they're if they see this as not just a transaction but as someone that actually is going to help them achieve something that's meaningful to them then they will ensure that the person they entrust to get them to their goal and to, to get there is someone that understands them and that they like and trust. And that can take mm. a bit of time, especially if it's a bigger ticket price, depending, you know, and especially in what Rob was talking about. So it comes down to human I'm, to I'm, human uh, experience. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm glad I brought it up because uh, all the conversations we've had so far have really been in within the context of delivering a service to someone who's decided to you know, become a client. Uh, but but actually, this is, there's a recognition that that six star experience has to start. Which, which way? Which way is back for you? Is it that way or is it that way? That there has to start way back in in when 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 there's that first you know even faint awareness of um of, of a of a of a company that you're thinking of doing doing business with um it's, it's not for now because we run out of time but it might be interesting to explore that a, a little more is that how do you create a six-star experience when there's no possibility of you know real human connection because there, there's too much distance uh, between but, uh, my, my one comment on that before we sign off is that i think it's your ability so of all of the people who might buy from you you've got the buyer's market who are ready to go right now and then you've got the waiting market which is usually much bigger and it's your ability to cater to the waiting markets until the points when they're actually when they're actually ready to do business it's your most, ability most, to most people to, are poor hmm. at, uh, nurturing the waiting market Exactly. It's your ability to educate that market uh, without expecting anything in return, but moving them into your orbit, if you like. You know, most people have linear sales funnels, but if you think of it as an orbit and people orbit around you, and sometimes they come closer and sometimes they move further away, and sometimes they come really close and become clients, but you don't know yeah. when that's going to be. And you have no control yeah. of that. In that one statement, Rashid, you, you just became Rob's new best friend. <laughs> he, hates, he, hates, he hates linear, just even the the, the, the concept of linear funnels just com, com, hates it with a passion. Um, so that, that's great. Av, any last um, last words before we before we sign off on this fascinating conversation? Well, I've heard... well, my other no, Sorry, go, Adam, Rashid. Go the the other amorphism, if you like, is I don't care how much you know until I know how much you care. And I think, uh, and then there's the platinum rule, do unto others as they would have done unto them rather than how you would like to be done unto. Yeah. Yeah, th th those, the trouble with those, uh, amorphism, is that what you what you call it? Mm. Is, is 
they're so well known that they become ignored. They're like the 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 do you want fries with that uh, that you were talking about about earlier. And yet, when you actually stop and listen and really hear the 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 the, the, the full intent and meaning of of just those two things that you shared there, Rashid, um, that's that's what it's all about. You know, yeah, and, and you've got to understand to, before being you have understood. to live it. You can't just say it. You have to live it. I mean, you yeah. really do have to care. <laughs> There's no yeah. point otherwise. I mean, people see through it. You know, they yeah. see through the superficial salesperson, glad handler, used car salesman. You know, press here, sign here, press hard three. You know, press hard the three copies. It doesn't work. Yeah. Have any Beautiful. last words? Love it. So, there's so much gold in this. Be authentic start the journey early and be, and be human and authentic and taking both what Rob said and what Rashid just said is begin that early on and allow the orbit to flourish and when they do become clients then that's when you give them that that care and protection and and without obviously um, losing yourself as you scale that's the other kind of key key point that you guys made um yeah i've gotten a lot from this pete have you i have yeah i'm glad you're there taking notes <laughs> i am so grateful uh from your for your insights tonight both of you i i love yeah. these conversations i never know where they're going to go how they're going to you know uh, evolve it's kind of like life and and a bit like the customer journey you know we don't know when someone's going to uh become our customer and come on the journey with us. And you guys happen to come here tonight with us and or this morning with us. And I'm just really grateful. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Me too. What, what, what I've said. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's, it's good night for me and it's good night from her. Wow. Hey, Pete. Good. So, wow. What a, what a great episode. I, I certainly love a good McDonald's reference, um, being a Macca's chick yeah. myself in my teenage years. But yeah, did that take you back? Did that take you back? Did. I had that memory of memories, being there, nightmares, Mc Happy Day, you know, lines to the door, you know, just trying to turn them over and pack those bags with the burgers and the fries. It was, it was fun. Um, was it interesting to know, know, know what you do now, though? I mean, that, yeah. that was really quite, quite a, almost like a formative experience for you really getting that insight into the yeah. human connection yep and i had no idea at the time i was what 16 or 17 and yeah. i didn't know but i'd you know logically i just knew that the that the way to connect and and make a better sale was to create that human connection rather than just being a robot and following the process and yeah what what a great grounding for me who, who would have known that you know all these years later I'd be sharing this and teaching it and preaching it uh, and running yeah. this podcast. Not, 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 not that many years later, surely. Yeah. Oh, only a few. <laughs> <laughs> Forget the well, fact listen, that I'll yeah. So, but, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, thanks again to to Rob and, and Rashid. And uh, just in terms of connecting, uh, one of the things that we'd like you, dear listener to do is to connect with us in some way, uh, even if that's going to uh, Apple Podcasts, whatever, and, and leaving us a review, uh, click the ratings. If you want to click five, that would be great, although we can't, we're not supposed to ask for it. Uh, <laughs> and if you want to email us at podcast at sixstarbusiness.com as well, tell us stories about uh, any six star experience that you've got. Uh, if you can think yeah. of, uh, if, if you if you want to be part of the conversation yourself or uh, you want to make an introduction to us to for someone to be a guest on the podcast uh, that'd be that'd be awesome thank you so much we look forward to meeting with you hopefully one day soon and uh, thank you for the reviews uh, have a wonderful six star day <laughs>